Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Loving the Game. I've got a very interesting guest, someone that I worked with for a few years and that I obviously follow on Twitter and social media, and also someone that's been in this environment for a while. Um, yeah, let's get to meet this gentleman today, um, none other than Johan Leroux. Johan, how are you doing? I'm very good, uh, Jock. Thank you very much for having me on. It really is a an honor and a privilege just to see some of your other guests. So I don't know if I've got much to offer, but you know, it's, uh, it's really wonderful to catch up with you and uh, just to be able to feature on the show. It, uh, it really is a privilege for me. So thank you very much for having me. Oh, thank you very, very much. I mean, uh, nobody is more important than anyone else, but I understand where you're coming from. So don't stress. You um, I mean, you can share some stories with us today. Obviously, you've mm -hmm. made some big names in your life, um, but we'll get on, we'll get on to that um, soon. Just tell us, what are, what are you busy with? I mean, obviously, we're all sitting um, in lockdown these days. But what do you do other than, you know, um, being, being stuck at home? Uh, what would you normally do? Uh, so at the moment, um, I've uh, ventured into a few different areas. So um, unfortunately, at the moment, there's no live rugby. But that's what I would usually be spending my weekends on, is to do live rugby commentary for Radio 2000 and a bit of sport reporting for SAFM. But at the moment, I'm actually doing uh, my internship in uh, clinical psychology. So I'm working here at a hospital in Port Elizabeth during the, the week and uh, completing my master's degree in that as well. But at the same time, doing as much sport broadcasting as possible. Unfortunately, as we all know, there's not much happening at the moment. But we trust that we will have some live rugby again uh, so that we can continue with that. Uh, but yeah, during the week, uh, I'm, I'm just working at the hospital. And then at the weekends, I'm, I'm pretty much just looking after my, my family, spending time with my kids, which is also a wonderful privilege. Uh, but I, I really am looking forward to rugby getting going again. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, interesting that you mentioned P. So are you based in P at the moment? I thought you were in Cape Town. I was in Cape Town at the beginning of last year. I had an opportunity to do a master's degree in Port Elizabeth. So my family, my wife and two, uh, two sons now, my son at uh, last year, we moved up. And uh, like I mentioned, doing an internship at the moment, uh, community service here will be next year. Hopefully I'll be able to move back down to Cape Town so that I can go a bit farewell to Newlands one last time uh, before it uh, turns into something else. But yeah, at the moment, I'm in Port Elizabeth. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, Johan, I mean, obviously, uh, mentioning Newlands and that you, you I, I mean, I know you're a province supporter. Where did your love for rugby <laughs> and sport in general start? At what age? Uh, I think what, yeah, my sport, my love for sport started at a very young age. My mom always says that uh, it was my sister and I, we never played with dolls or cars or trucks or anything like that. We've always played with rugby balls, cricket balls, tennis balls, anything that had anything to do with sport. So my family really introduced me to sport. And then rugby specifically, my dad introduced me to the game at a very young age. He refereed uh, high school matches, club matches. So most Saturday afternoons, I would be traveling somewhere to either Paul or Stellenbosch or Cape Town to go and be the ball boy because he was the referee. So I got to hang out on the sidelines, either stand behind the poles waiting for the ball to come my way. So that started at a very young age. And then also he introduced me to Newlands at a young age as well. I was trying to think back of of when, when was my first time that I went to Newlands? But it, um, I think it, it was maybe the, the Rugby World Cup match that was there between South Africa and Romania. And I remember going with my dad and my grandpa. And that was also made such a big impression on me. And after that, most Saturday afternoons, if there was rugby on at Newlands, my dad and I would go. And that was always uh, such a wonderful uh, occasion as well because we always sat on the, on the Donny Craven stand, always sat in the same seats. He had season tickets there. And so most Saturdays I would be there watching Western Province later on the Stormers, the box as well. Um, and he also he introduced me to the, the sleepover father-son event where I got oh, yeah. to meet Bobby Skinstat and Chester Williams and those guys. And all those memories, I think, just all culminated in me really, really becoming very passionate about the game of rugby. And then obviously later on started playing it at school as well. What did you play when you were at school? I played center, um, so I was never very fast. So I played inside center because every now and then I could hit a gap, but then I never had enough pace to complete the try. So then I was yeah. always looking for my outside center or wing or fullback or somebody to go and, go and finish the try. But yeah, I played uh, first team. It wasn't a very good rugby school, but it was decent enough. So, so yeah. Yeah, I always enjoyed playing. But then after school, um, I started realizing that 
uh, our school's players weren't quite as big as some of the other players. So when I saw them, I thought this is my time to, to hand in my <laughs> retirement and, and find a different way to stay involved in the game. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> um, obviously, um, you mentioned some, you mentioned Bobby and Chester, you know, that you met that um, the father, you know, all the sleepover at Newlands and stuff. But who were, who were some of the players that you actually looked up to um, from a playing perspective, and guys that you admired? I think looking back, um, I mean, I was six years old when we won the Rugby World Cup in 1995. So Francois Pinar always had this stature and like he always mm. was somebody that you aspired to be like because he just had this presence. And then I also remember um, I, I met Andre Hubert at some training camp, I think the Springboks had, and they had an opportunity for kids to go and meet some of the players. And, and Andre Hubert, I remember shaking his hand and he's just his whole hand covered my hand. And for some reason, those two players stand out for me from a young age. And then fortunately, I, I was privileged enough to get to know some of the other uh, players back then later on, on a um, almost like a friendly basis. So I met Chester Williams when I was younger and then also interacted with him once or twice uh, when, he, when I was older as well. So he was always uh, a, a legend in my eyes, uh, looking back from from the time when I was young, obviously also playing for Western Province, um, he, yeah. he, was a, he was a favorite of mine. Oh, that's really, really nice. Johan, um, I mean, just let's, let's keep on in life. I mean, you mentioned you played rugby at school and you played first team, and then you realized, well, you know, um, this is not obviously going to be your career, and you are gonna have to make some choices in life, um, of which you obviously made some interesting choices. Um, I did mention earlier that we've worked together before, but I mean before you and I got um, or got acquainted in the you know in the working environment. Um, the, you obviously, as you went through life um, before you got into television broadcasting, which is obviously what I do. Um, I mean, what you you went to study? I mean, just just take us through through what you study because I think it's very interesting to know that. I mean, the, the routes in life that you've taken has been quite interesting, actually. I mean, even now when you told us you're doing, what's it, clinical psychology or something? Yeah. I mean, no, that's like, for me, you know, it's, it's actually it's so cool to hear, you know, how your life just keeps on evolving. Yeah, no, I was, um, so after school, I, I studied theology and I was actually working at a church for a couple of years. And, and during that time, I got involved at a community radio station in Somerset West called Radio Halderberg. And that's when my love for broadcasting really started. But I, I started it as a hobby, not quite sure where it was going to going to to take me. And then at some point, because I, I thought about this quite a bit today, because I knew you were going to ask me this question. And I remember while I was working at the church, I really enjoyed my work there. But there was one day, it was a Friday morning, and I, the, the Stormers were playing against the Blues in New Zealand, and I really, really wanted to watch the rugby match, but I had other commitments as well. And eventually I managed to, because my work was quite flexible, so I managed to go home and watch the end of the game. And during that moment, I thought, well, I really want to be able to do this for a living. I want to be able to watch rugby for a living. And that's yeah. when I started uh, really making an effort to to try and become a, a sport broadcaster. Uh, during my time at Radio Halderberg, I met Martin Locke, who's obviously a, a legend in the sport okay. broadcasting industry. And if it wasn't for that meeting that I had with him, uh, I would not have had the opportunities that I had. And I always think they often get people asking me, how do you become a broadcaster? I really want to do it. Uh, so obviously, I think you do need to have some kind of ability, but at the same time, you need some luck as well. And and that meeting that I had with Martin really was a, a lucky meeting. And he spent about two years training me, preparing me for the first oh, opportunity wow. that I had to go to Johannesburg and uh, to go and work at Supersport where, where you and I met. But that's also... Um, can I can I tell that story uh, of how I actually... Because that's obviously the dream. Yeah, when you get into too, broadcasting, you want to... You want to you want to work at, at super sport so i was getting a little bit frustrated because i was working at the radio station but things weren't really happening and then super sport blitz sent out this tweet that said they're looking for sport journos so i applied and apparently they had loads of applications and i was one of i think about 40 uh, journalists that were chosen to come up to come and do this test and back then i wasn't uh, we didn't have a lot of money so my wife and i we spoke about it and we said no it's an opportunity that I can't miss out on, I need to go up to Joburg to go and write this test and see if I'm good enough to go and work at Supersport. So that obviously was a really, really big occasion. And then I got to the test and I think it was out of 45 and you're only allowed to get six wrong. And I think I got nine wrong. And oh. so I failed the test and I was so defeated after that. 
And I remember Ian Turner, who was, uh, you know very well, and who, who was the head of, of the channel at that stage, uh, looked at me, and I think he could see the disappointment in my eyes. And he said to me, well, if you want to, you can come back in a few months' time. You just need to go and study up on your local soccer, which I didn't know much about uh, yeah, that seems at to that be the stage. Big one. <laughs> and, uh, but in that, and we, then he looked at my answers again, and he realized that I think I got all the rugby questions right, and he was quite surprised by that. And so he must have kept me in the back of his mind because a couple of year, um, a couple of months later, I got a phone call from Lo Rensberg, who was the the head of rugby at SuperSport at that stage. And it was a bit of an awkward phone call because I wasn't expecting it at all. And he asked yeah. me who I am, and he said, "Do you want to do commentary?" So I said, "Yes." And and he said, "Well, we're thinking of using you at Craven Week in Polokwane. This was in 2013." So I said, "Okay, like tell me, I can book the tickets. I'll, I'll be there." And he said, "No, we'll arrange everything for you." Uh, and that was my first real opportunity to go and do live rugby commentary uh, for Supersport, which was a massive occasion. But um, obviously being new into it, uh, the first day I didn't feel went very well. And I was also yeah. a little bit despondent after that. But um, I still remember on the commentary team, I think it was Warren Brosnian and, and Gavin Cowley. And I think Shimi and Yanis Chimangi was also there. And, and they just kind of pulled me together and they asked me a bit about myself. And, and somehow I just all of a sudden started feeling part of the team and... And that was where my, my super sport broadcasting career really took off and, and I had some good opportunities after that. Oh, that's a really cool story, actually. Um, I mean, on one of our earlier questions and speaking of Lo, um, you know, Lawrence Rensberg, he's actually got a question here. Who's your all-time best center in SA and the world? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, he's actually watching today. Well, I just want to say to Lo that uh, I really am grateful for him taking that opportunity on me, especially after that first day, because I, I really don't think that, that I was very good. And I was kind of expecting him to tell me to not to rock up on the next day. <laughs> but he gave me a few opportunities and we worked together at other channels later on as well. So I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I think center wise in South Africa, I, I would say, I mean, I, I, I wasn't fortunate enough to, to be around when Donny Kherba and the likes were playing, but I've obviously seen a few clips, and he's obviously a legend in the South African yeah. centre world. But for me, I think the biggest, the best centre that I've seen play for South Africa is Jock Fury, who was just phenomenal. His ability on attack and on defence as well. And then looking at centre pairings uh, worldwide, I don't think, uh, I haven't seen any better than Ma Nanu and Conrad Smith. And uh, for me, they, those were the, the standout centres that I've been able to, to watch play. Um, so now you finally joined Supersport and, uh, um, and then you, you obviously got back to Blitz at some stage because, I mean, that's where I met you and got to know you um, better and spent quite a few years there. Um, I mean, how, uh, just, give, maybe just give people an idea of what the Blitz environment is about. I mean, it hasn't really changed that much since you've left, that I can tell you. Uh -huh. um, and I mean, but just... Just give people, I mean, that's watching, you know, just an idea of what what it actually entails. Because um, something that I've realized is that a lot of people don't actually realize what goes into working at Blitz or, you know, putting a Blitz bulletin together, for instance. Definitely. Yeah. And, and I think also before I entered into that space, I thought uh, working at Supersport Blitz is this very glamorous job. And then yeah. you have to cover golf uh, on a Saturday morning or Sunday morning, <laughs> one o'clock, two o'clock. And all of a sudden, it's not so glamorous anymore. But, but yeah, my journey to Blitz also, I, it started with an awkward phone call. Peter Davies gave me a call and he said um, he's seen some of my work and he got my name from Ian Turner as well. There was an opportunity to move up to Johannesburg to go and work there. And, and it was also a no-brainer for me to, to leave things behind in, in West, the Western Cape. And my wife and I decided we wanted to move up. And uh, that seems to be the pattern. If you want to make it in broadcasting, you need to make that move up to Johannesburg. And I'm really yeah. grateful that I did. But working at Supersport Blitz, is, that is where I learned broadcasting because there you have to learn how to work under pressure. You're, working, uh, you're watching three or four soccer matches at the same time, sometimes on a Champions League night. Then you have to cover some other breaking news stories. You have to do headlines at the same time. Uh, you know that the bosses are wa watching, so you want to get it right to make sure that there aren't any spelling mistakes. And then at yeah. the same time, you're also you're working with, uh, it's not just you, you're working with your, your editor 
as well. And, and you also, you have to work as a team because if there's going to be miscommunication between the two of you, uh, then it, it's not going to go well. So fortunately, I was privileged to work with a lot of really good editors such as yourself and somebody who's really passionate about, about the, the, the story that you're putting out because you feel as if, if you're scripting and voicing, that's only half the picture. You need the, the yeah. actual picture to, to be able to tell the story as well. So that was, um, yeah, that was where I really learned what broadcasting is like. And you learn how to work under a lot of pressure. And at the same time, you, you sometimes complain about the working hours, but you also realize you're getting paid to watch TV. And uh, it really yeah. was a, a wonderful time in my life uh, working at Supersport Blitz. <laughs> I mean, like you said, there's, you know, working under pressure. I don't think there is, I mean, besides working, I think, on a live, on a live production, which you obviously had the experience of as well. I mean, there's no, there's no second takes, you know, you've got to, if you said something, you know, it's out there. So, I mean, you understand the, the pressures and stuff. And like you say, Super Sport Blitz had, had a, a different kind of a pressure, obviously. Um, Johan, um, obviously sport then was, you know, properly part of your life, um, you know, and still, still is wherever possible. But I mean, at that stage of the game, that was all you were doing basically. And day in, day out, night in, night out, like, as you mentioned, sitting at, sitting there <laughs> watching golf till two o'clock in the morning, you know, <laughs> hoping that there's no playoff because then it's two o'clock and become three o'clock. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> but yeah, that's how it works. And, um, I mean, eventually, you also got opportunities to to be on radio, as you mentioned earlier on. You do, um, you do. Uh, I think you do commentary work as well for you know for yeah. radio. It's a, it's, what's it? SAFM and Radio Two Thousand. Um, how did that opportunity come around? So yeah, so during my time at SuperSport, I continued working on on radio on weekends for Seven O Two and for Nine Four Seven and Cape Talk and KFM. So that was also nice to be able to balance the two. Um, and radio is obviously it's it's similar but in a way it's very different as well because you don't have any pictures you need to use your words to describe the story so then in i think it was 2015 i i managed to win uh, an mtn radio award for sport yeah. for the best sport presenter in the country and for me that was such a, a massive honor because i was on a list with cs C with mark lewis with darren scott obviously guys that i grew up listening to and, and for me, that was really a privilege to, to be nominated alongside of them. And then I, I won the award, which was even more mind-blowing for me. But then um, after that, uh, the head of sport, uh, radio sports at SABC uh, got in touch with me and said that there's an opportunity. They're looking for somebody for rugby. It was the start of the Rugby World Cup. And then I decided to, to make the move away from Supersport to SABC, knowing that there was an opportunity for me to do radio and, and television work. So mm -hmm. there I started doing radio commentary, which... I feel is also a little bit more challenging than I think TV commentary because there it's also just your words that's describing the story, but something that I, I love doing. I often say that those 80 minutes are my favorite part of the week because you get to tell the whole story, uh, which is a really, I really enjoy doing that. And then at the same time, I managed to work on TV for the 2015 Rugby World Cup, um, managed to work with the likes of Udo Karls, Kennedy Timba, Peter de Villiers was one of the guests as well. And that was also a, such a great occasion because I was able to be part of the Rugby World Cup, uh, my first Rugby World Cup that I was part of as a broadcaster. And to yeah. be able to be there on television, speaking to millions of people so that all, over the, all over South Africa was really a great privilege. And unfortunately, the results didn't go the way of South Africa. But from a personal point of view, uh, that was definitely one of my career highlights. Oh, great. Tell me, Jan, what are the challenges in radio commentary? So I think one of the biggest challenges is that you can't allow there to be too much dead air and you need to fill the silences. So every now and then you have the referee might come through and you can take a bit of a break. But the rest of the time, it's 80 minutes of full on talking, you describing the action. So I think uh, it's only happened a few times, but every now and then you have a big injury that uh, takes about five, 10 minutes to clear up. And you need to you need to be prepared for that and you need to be able to fill that time. And you can't just say, let's go to pictures or let's go to an ad break. Yeah. You need to, con to continue talking. Uh, and that's also something that Martin Locke told me when I was very young. He said, even if you only use 10% of what you've prepared for, 
make sure that you prepare 100% for every time that you go on air because you never know when there's going to be a 10-minute period or a 15-minute period for you to fill. So I always make sure that I have plenty of stats with me. I always make sure that I that I try to, if I'm in the area, try to attend the press conferences just so you can yeah. know or you, what you're talking about. You can see, uh, you're not just reading comments from the coach. You can see uh, the way that he said something and uh the, you can sometimes see a twinkle in a coach's eye when he's talking about a specific plan that they have or a specific player that they're naming at a different position. And those are something that you then need to try and describe on the radio as well. So I think it's also just about, yeah, filling the dead air. And then, uh, I mean, sometimes you stumble over your words because so many things are happening at the same time. Uh, and I think it's okay for a radio commentator to do that. But I think it's just about picking yourself up afterwards and making yeah. sure that uh, that you recover after 10 things have happened at the same time and you catching the action when the ball is now three players away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, any, any, any funny moments that happened to you while you've been doing radio commentary? Like behind the scenes, uh, something that I can't think of, of too many. I've, I've also, fortunately with technology, I've been able to do quite a few rugby commentary matches from home. So you're busy watching on screen and you're using your internet connection. Uh, and so every now and then your family or somebody walks past or the, uh, so something like that. So I'm trying to think of funny moments. Um, I can't think of any, any funny moments, but also even in just in, in doing radio commentary, I got to, to meet a few um, yeah. rugby commentators coming over from New Zealand. So, so that was also nice. So you and the one box screaming when the box are scoring a try, he's sitting next door shouting at the All Blacks when, when, the, when the box have scored a try. So that's also it's quite interesting. But yeah, I'm trying to think of any funny moments, but I, I can't think of any right now. No, I mean, it, you, you're probably lucky that it hasn't happened yet. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Um, what, yeah. has your, what has been your um, best game that you've broadcast so far? I think uh, there's a couple that stand out uh, on radio. I, was, um, I did the, the Rugby World Cup first game for South Africa and New Zealand last year. And that was doing it in studio in Port Elizabeth. But... For me, that was um, that was also one of the the games that I, that I managed to win an award on. But for me, that was also one of those games that every now now and then you do a game and everything just flows and it happens and you know that that what you're putting out there is um, or at least you feel like it's it's quality work because you've been preparing for it and you've put in a lot of effort and there's so much excitement around the first game of a rugby World Cup. Unfortunately, South Africa didn't win that game, yeah. <laughs> but again, for me, per, from a personal point of view. Uh, that was definitely a highlight. I've done a couple of Curry Cup finals, and then also I did the the first uh, Springbok All Black game was in 2018 when they played at Newlands, and for me that was also a highlight just because I managed to be at the field and and uh, uh, just to be part of that uh, experience as well was was really wonderful. Geez, uh, that must have been great. I mean, when you found out you were going to do that game, you must have been over the moon. Yes, and uh, that's one of those games that you continue telling your bosses. You remember, I'm in Cape Town. I'm available for this. I'm making sure that my diary is clear, and, and you make sure that they that you just keep reminding them that you you're keen for it. Uh, so yeah, no, that was a, definitely a career highlight. Um, there's a question again from Lo. How did you enjoy working in Africa on rugby broadcasts? Yeah, so I was also very fortunate um, for a couple of years, 2017, 2018, to travel all over Africa to do rugby commentary on uh, the, the, the Gold Cup, as it was known back then, which was Africa's top teams, excluding South Africa, that was a qualifier for the Rugby World Cup. So that was also a, a, a very unique experience because I managed to travel to Tunisia, Morocco, Uganda, Zambia, all sorts of countries that I never thought I'd have the privilege to go to. And yeah. uh, I got to do something I love there, which was really great. A lot of technical difficulties in, in some of the African countries, but, but that's also, and I, I think this is one of those sayings as well, is that, uh, that, that rugby in Africa, if, or if you're broadcasting in Africa, if you can do it there, then you can do it in other places as well, because you really have to deal with a lot of technical difficulties. And uh, sometimes things don't work the way that they, they should and uh, it's maybe not just uh, maybe just uh, not necessarily lack of knowledge, but maybe just a lack of a lack of the uh, technical things that you need around you to be able to make a broadcast go smoothly. Um, but if you have a, a good director and if you your co-commentator is staying calm, then you're able to still put out a, a relatively decent product. So no, it was it was really a great experience to be able to do that. Uh, just another question here before we move on. 
And do you ever get to listen to some of your shows? I mean, it must be a bit difficult to do that unless you somehow record it. Yeah, I know. In, in the beginning, I, I, I recorded everything and I still record a lot of things and I listen back. Uh, if I listen back to some of the stuff that I did five, six years ago, I cringe because I realize just how terrible it was. Uh, but no, I, I do try and record most of the, the uh, most of the rugby matches that I do. Um, every now and then I, I realize that was a terrible game, so I'm not going to have a listen to that one. Uh, but you do listen because you pick up so many things where you, you keep going back to a specific phrase and you realize that maybe that's something that you need to work on. And I think it's just a way to improve and, and to continue getting better as a, as a commentator. But, yeah, no, I try to listen as regularly as possible. So while you were at SABC, um, um, I could be mistaken, but while you were at SABC and you obviously got the opportunity to work on the Rio Olympics as well, because I know you were there. I'm not sure if that was through SABC or what it was through. Um, but I'm sure it was, and you actually got to travel to Rio, and I'm not sure how long you were there for, um, but um, I remember following you on Twitter, and um, uh, it was quite, well, Facebook even, uh, because you posted quite a lot of things, and, and I remember it was it was quite hectic, actually, um, you know, the, the daily travel, and, you know, getting from, you know, venue to venue, and doing whatever you had to do to cover what you had to do, but just tell us about the whole experience, you know, of the Olympics, Rio, you know, all of that. I mean, how long you were there for? Yeah, no, Rio was unbelievable. Um, I was also, I mentioned earlier, you need some luck to be able to to get certain opportunities. And that was really yeah. lucky. I wasn't originally on the list of people to go. Uh, and then somebody, for some reason, was removed from the team. And they needed somebody who could speak Afrikaans and English. And, and I had the privilege to go to Rio, which was absolutely incredible. I often thought that my highlight would be to be at a Rugby World Cup. But I, I struggle to see how a Rugby World Cup can, can top the Olympic Games. Because you have the sure. world's top stars there. Um, um, and you get uh, so many different sports, so many different dynamics. So that was really, really uh, a great experience. Uh, Rio itself, it, there were definitely some challenges um, in terms of transport from the, the, the broadcast center to some of the different venues. And then also the time difference made it a little bit difficult to do live crossings to this side. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I mean, I managed to to do interviews with, with Wade Fanikak the day before his record-breaking run and the day afterwards, which is something that's still special to me. I was on the field when the... Because my main assignment there was the, the sevens. So I was on yeah. the field when South Africa played. Uh, they lost that semi-final. And, and it's also something that you try to describe in words, but you can't describe the pain in Neil Powell and Carl Brown's eyes when they lost that semi-final because there was so much pressure on them and they put so much pressure on themselves to go and win the gold medal. Um, yeah. so, so those are sorts of moments that stand out for me. Fortunately, they managed to recover and win bronze. Uh, but yeah, the, being at the Olympic Games is, is, was really a, a career highlight and I, I struggle to see how something will top that. Which was some of the athletes you've mentioned, Wade, Funny Kirk, obviously you worked on the sevens. Um, what other athletes did you get to meet? Uh, so I met a lot of the South Africans. Uh, I've, I've, a standout for me was was uh, Gary Player because he was the coach of the South African golfing uh, team. So he's also one of those people that uh, when you meet him, he just makes such a big impact on you. Um, yeah. I met a lot of the golfers. Uh, Sergio Garcia was there. Um, I'm trying to think now. Um, I got to watch tennis. I think Andy Murray was in the, the gold medal match, if I'm not mistaken. The, the Williams sisters played in the doubles there. So I got to watch tennis, which in South Africa isn't something we don't often get to see uh, top yeah. tennis players. So that was quite uh, quite a something for me. Um, and yeah, the, the rest of the... You, you see them kind of walking by the, the big names, uh, the likes of Usain Bolt, uh, but you don't really... Um, I wasn't part of the, the teams that got to go and interview um, them okay. um, in their venues. But, yeah, you, you kind of see them walking around and you realize that you are in the, the presence of sporting royalty. Yes, see, uh, that must be amazing. I mean, so, I mean, what's, what, what are other plans? I mean, you obviously you're busy studying in a different direction now and don't know what your plans are for the future, um, you know, uh, are you still gonna? Are you still gonna try and keep in touch with the broadcasting side of life, or have you now made a call that you wanna rather kind of settle in life, if I can call it that, almost? <laughs> no, I think I think once that that radio bug bit at a young age, that's it's never gonna let you go. I don't want to leave it ever. Um, I think 
for me, the, the reason why I, I made the change was I've always had, I've, I've loved sport from a young age, but I also realized that my interest was more in the people behind the sport. So when I got to do an interview with an A.B. de Villiers or with a Faf de Plessis or somebody, I was almost more interested in, in what made them be as a person, not necessarily yeah. their sporting achievements. And that was one of the reasons why I decided to make the change. And, well, not to make the change, but to add this to my, my career and to, to maybe if there's an opportunity in the future to specialize in something like sports psychology. Uh, I think there's a big need for that in South Africa. I know that yeah. there's a lot of good work um, that's being happening in, in other countries, I think in South Africa. There are a few sports psychologists and we are putting some emphasis on that. I don't think quite enough yet. So if there's an opportunity to combine the two, that will be great. Uh, from a broadcasting point of view, I'd love to continue doing what I'm doing at the moment, uh, as just to do rugby commentary on, on radio. If there's an opportunity to do some more of that on TV as well, I'd be grateful for that. And, and who knows, maybe also to, to try and be at, uh, at a future Olympic Games or at, another, or at a Rugby World Cup as well. Um, France 2023 is coming up. Um, so that, uh, that would also obviously be a dream. But um, yeah, there's, uh, I think in the sporting, sport broadcasting world, there's always going to be something else that you want to go and achieve. So plenty of those things that, uh, that are still there. Um, you're mentioning obviously going to another Olympics and stuff. Um, I was full of questions today. You, and obviously, as you know, the, <laughs> the next Olympics is in Tokyo, which is, which is pretty much you know, a requirement of Japanese. So maybe if you can sharpen up on your Japanese, there might be a gap. <laughs> oh, yeah, Actually, but... I did learn, uh, when I was with Lowe, yeah, I did, I did study a bit of Japanese. I had a teacher up in Johannesburg when I was studying oh, okay. there. And, and then, uh, but yeah, I've, uh, unfortunately with the, the, the studying in, the, in a different field, I've had to let some of that go. But, but who knows, maybe I'll start, uh, start working on some French for the 2023 uh, Rugby World Cup. Um, and I also think uh, that's something that I've really enjoyed is learning a different language. Fortunately, you've got Duolingo and apps that make it quite easy nowadays to be able to do that. Um, and, and I also think maybe for somebody who wants to get in the sport broadcasting industry, I think that's, a, that's sometimes the lens that you have to go to to get your lucky break is sometimes having to learn another language, sometimes having to get another skill because uh, it's so competitive to get opportunities. So you really need to to put yourself out there. You really need to work hard to be able to get some of those opportunities. And uh, maybe I'm giving some of my tips away, but uh, if you've got your, got your eye on a big event, uh, try to learn one, one of the learn local languages and, and maybe that'll open up a door for you in the future. Yeah, yeah. So, Johan, I mean, we, we're talking a bit of rugby as well and stuff like that. So, um, I mean, obviously, you mentioned Newlands earlier on. It's a... Uh, it's, a, it's obviously a standout venue for you, and um, you have op you've had opportunities to visit other venues. So, um, I mean, how do you feel about the fact that they're going to, sorry to say it like that, but demolish Newlands? Yeah, no, it's um, uh, it's actually I get a little bit emotional thinking about that just because of the great memories that I had there, especially with with my family, and I always had this this dream that I would take my son to Newlands as well every Saturday and to go and show him the rugby that I was privileged to, to watch with my dad. Uh, but obviously from a financial point of view, it makes total sense to, to take uh, the Stormers and Western Province to the Cape Town Stadium. I actually made a commitment to my son. He's only three, um, so I don't think he remembers, but I, I said to him at the beginning of the year, I'll take him to a rugby game at Newlands before they demolish it. And I don't know if I'm going to get that opportunity now with COVID-19. Hopefully there'll be a, a farewell for Newlands. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, Newlands for me is the, well, it's my favorite rugby stadium in the world. Then it's going to be a sad day when, when there's going to be rugby there no longer. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a province supporter or anything, but I think Newlands at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's, um, it's you know, it's the home of rugby for South Africa, even though, I mean, a lot of guys would obviously say Alice Park is probably, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, rugby started in, 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 Cape Town and at Newlands, so yeah, it's a sad, it's a, it's pretty sad. Um, what do I, what has been your most memorable moment from a rugby perspective? Sure, I, I think. Um, lot, so I mean, it can't be too many to pick from, but um, <laughs> except what obviously a part of my question is most memorable moment from a rugby perspective, excluding um, rugby World Cup wins. <laughs> Uh, that's a that's a tough one. I think, um, sure. Uh, 
in let me just get my years right i think it was 2017 uh, when the when western province won the won the curry cup uh they played the final it was in the 20, 2017 i think it was they played the was. final in 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 durban against the sharks and I, I think that moment just stands out for me because i was privileged to be part of their campaign because i attended their press conferences from when the season started and I got to know John Dobson a little bit. And, and I think just seeing what it meant to him and Chris Van Sale and, and the rest of the players was, um, again, bringing that, that human aspect into the game, uh, definitely something that stands out for me because it wasn't just about the, the trophy that they won. Um, yeah, yeah. I got to know the players behind, uh, be, off the field as well. Uh, so definitely, I think that must be uh, one of the, the highlights. And, and it's just something that stirs inside of you. It's, it's, you realize there it's more, more than just rugby. Um, yeah. Trying to think back of other memories as well. Obviously, Rugby World Cups are, are massive. Uh, the one in 2019, the one in 2007 and 1995 as well. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, being part of that, that well, not part of it, but feeling like I'm part of that Western Province campaign when they won the Curry Cup uh, final in Durban was, was quite a special moment. And most disappointing moment? Oh, most disappointing moment. Um, probably also going back to, to 2015, going back to that, to that Rugby World Cup um, when South Africa lost against Japan. Uh, that was also something that I struggled to, to wrap my head around. Um, and, and obviously now, now looking back and seeing the analysis that was done by Eddie Jones and how the, the Japan managed to beat the box, you, it kind of makes sense. But in that moment, it was just something that was quite hard to, to take. And, um, yeah. and I mean, I, couldn't, I can't imagine what the players felt like, but I had to go on air later in the day because I did the, the later game. I think Italy played against somebody. And I almost had to, to pull myself straight because I was, I was struggling to deal with the fact that South Africa lost against Japan. <laughs> Um, and so maybe also just, just going back, I think uh, you asked about a career highlights. I think being part of, of Namibia's um, journey to the Rugby World Cup was also quite a, a privilege for me because I managed to do some of their matches uh, that they, that they uh, played in, in qualification for the Rugby World Cup. And they also yeah. got to know Phil Davies, the coach of Namibia. Uh, yeah. quite well as well and just to see what it meant to him and what it meant to those players and for them to actually go to to the world cup in 2019 to go and represent africa and to really do the continent quite proud i'm i'm very disappointed that they didn't have that final game against canada because yeah. i'm convinced they would have picked up their first win uh, but I that agree. was also quite a highlight for me yeah no i agree with you there um do you have any like uh, memorabilia or something that that's very close to your heart that Someone signed something maybe or, or just something that you got from a rugby player. I don't know. I mean, is there something that you, I mean, you don't have to show it to us, but you can just maybe tell us mm. about it. If you do have something like yeah. that. Yeah. No, I think for, for me, um, I, th I think I still have a few autographs from um, that day that I mentioned, that the Newlands day when I, I, um, I was, went with my dad and we stayed over at Newlands. So I got a few autographs on a shirt. I think that's still somewhere. For me, it's all, always just been about taking some pictures with some players. Yeah. Um, working at Supersport, had the privilege to take a picture with Johnny Wilkinson, uh, yeah. with uh, Ryan Giggs. So, so those are memories that, um, yeah, that I will once, when, one day when I, I move into my home and I know this is going to be the home that I'm going to have for the rest of my life, I'm planning on putting all those photos everywhere because it really is such a special thing to be able to take pictures with some of these, these unique players. So definitely uh, some photos that I have with, with quality players like that. And then also um, when I went to Rio for the Olympics, we were given a medal just to say that we were part of the broadcast team. So that oh, was no. also quite special. Um, and then obviously I'm, I'm quite sentimental in that way. I still have my accreditation for all the matches that I've been to, uh, all the travels that I did in Africa, kept a lot of the plane tickets as well. So, so I've got oh, a lot wow. of special memories looking back at some of those things. Yeah, shucks, man. That's really nice. You, you, like you say, if you do get that house one day, uh, you should frame all of it or do something with it that's, you know, that, so that it's not locked away somewhere because I think that mm. happens quite often sometimes. We have such precious pieces. And, um, you know, you don't get to share it with people. Um, mm. And just another question that popped up here on the side is, who's your favorite rugby commentator worldwide? Oh, that's a, a good question. Um, I think at the and I think in South Africa, we've had some of the best commentators. I think Hugh Bladen in his prime was absolutely brilliant. And, yeah. um, and then also now Matthew Pierce is somebody that, 
I don't think there's a better rugby commentator than Matthew Pierce uh, at the moment worldwide. So definitely two of them are, are some of my favorites. Um, and then also, I mean, you've got your, your legendary cricket and commentators as well uh, and, and soccer commentators. But, but staying with rugby, I would say, yeah, I'm, I mean, it might be a cliche um, because I'm from South Africa and Matthew Pierce is yeah. South African. But I would say that he's probably the, the top commentator in the world right now. Johan, if you could, um, I mean, obviously with what you do, you get to meet, um, you get to meet sports personalities, um, um, you know, because of your travels and stuff, you maybe go and commentate somewhere and I'm sure as a commentator, you also get to meet the player sometimes. If there's one player in the world or any, any sportsman, it doesn't have to be rugby, um, if you want to stick to rugby, you can, but if there's any sports person in the world that you could ask one question to, who would that person be and what would that question be? Oh, you're putting me on the spot here. Um, that is a, a very good good question. I think... Now, now you know. Now you know how it feels when <laughs> we normally ask the question. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, also, I'm going to keep it local, but I think for me... Um, being based in the Western Cape, I, I got to to ask Sia Kalisia a lot of questions because he was obviously he was playing for the Stormers in Western Province, and then I never got to speak to him. I haven't gotten to speak to him after that that Rugby World Cup. Um, yeah. So for me, I think I would love to have a sit down with him one day, with with Sia, and just to ask him, just to ask him what what that was like. Um, for the and and also just to maybe to to ask him how how he managed to do what he did um i think again i mean obviously rassi erasmus deserves a lot of credit for what happened during the 2019 rugby world cup but uh sia played a much bigger role uh not necessarily rugby wise but in terms of of uniting the team so um yeah i would i would love to sit down with him just um one night and just ask him exactly how that happened, how that felt and, and how it feels for him to realize that, that he's made such a big impact on so many people worldwide. Um, so that's from a South African point of view. I'd also yeah. really like to, to sit down with Richie McCaw one day. I'm still very interested to know how painful it was to play with that broken leg in that 2011 Rugby World Cup final. And, and Richie McCaw has always been one of my, my rugby heroes just because of of the the player that he was um yeah. but that was also something that i mean he, he addressed it in his book and, and i know there's, there's a movie about him but to be able to speak to him one-on-one -on -one about that was also be uh, you must get some unique insights and and especially how he managed to hide it from his coaches and how he managed to to play a rugby world cup final and to win it with a, a broken leg pretty much yeah that's crazy uh, that would be really really cool i mean i mean she's uh, i don't know if there's any other stories you can share with us um, it's been really cool to, to catch up with you again like this, unfortunately like this, but that's just the times we live in. And hopefully one day we'll, our paths will, will, will cross again. Um, but yeah, geez, I mean, thanks for your time. It's been really, really nice chatting to you and catching up, like I said. Um, your plans for the future, how long are you planning to be in PE still? Yeah, so my plans, uh, no, thank you very much for having me, Jock. Uh, it really has been great to catch up. Uh, I know that uh, we have our interactions on Twitter, which is which are always enjoyable. And I'll always be a Western Province supporter, and you'll always be a Bull supporter. So we'll have our differences. But no, it's been we great to be on here. Yeah. We can't all support the Bulls, unfortunately. So, um, <laughs> Hopefully, well, I know that. We need a bit of opposition you... to make life interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure Jake White is uh, is going to have a big impact there. No future plans for us. Um, our our second son was born. Uh, he's two months old now. So um, yeah, so I'm just spending all my time and energy on my, my wife and two sons, and uh, yeah. we'd like to move back to Cape Town. Hopefully at the end of the year, depending on where I get placed for my community service here, and and uh, continue. Um, yeah, continue raising our family over there and, and continue staying involved in rugby as much as possible. But yeah, like I said, um, kind of switching focus a little bit to the psychology. I'm really enjoying my work at the moment um, uh, in the hospital and, and to do that at the same time as well. So uh, you mentioned, I think somewhere you mentioned that how your, sometimes your path goes and you're not sure how it's going to work out. So that's kind of where I am now. I'm excited to see yeah. how it all works out. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm just... Um, I'm I'm privileged. I'm grateful for the opportunities that I've been able to have. No, that's awesome, and I mean, keep grabbing them as they come along. And 
I know whatever you do, you normally make a success of it. So, yeah, I mean, stay positive. And like I said, hopefully we'll see each other somewhere along the line again. Um, who knows where. And yeah, I hope all your studies or your, you know, what, you, what you're busy with at the moment really goes well. And you maybe get to work in, in bigger circles than just broadcasting. Maybe you'll be a, a psychologist for one of the, maybe the Springboks one day. Who knows? So, <laughs> Yeah, um, stay well, look after yourself, and um, yeah, keep in touch, please. No, thank you very much. Uh, like I said, thank you so much for having me on, Jock. Uh, I really enjoy watching your journey as well, and, and just to continue to, to see how the, the Yellow Cap website is also just continuing to grow. So thank you. It's been a privilege to be on here, and uh, yeah, hope that, uh, that I hope that we get to sit in the same studio again at some point and uh, get, to, get to put some more quality stories together. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm.